have Comrade Tony Ngeni, who will be giving to us a live lecture on the role of ex-combatants in the ongoing revolutionary struggle for radical economic emancipation. Comrade Tony is a member of the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress and also a member of the National Working Committee. In those capacities, he chairs the Subcommittee on Peace and Stability of the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress. He is in a particularly good position to be able to talk to us tonight about the role of ex-combatants in continuing to work for liberation and maintaining a commitment to the essence for full liberation. As an MK veteran, as a commander of Umkonto Wisiswe, and as a long-standing and committed member of the African National Congress throughout his life, we are grateful that Comrade Tony agreed to present this lecture on our RET Facebook group page. I'm now going to hand over to Comrade Tony to proceed with the lecture. Comrade. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Comrade uh, Karl. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear comrades, I welcome everyone who's joining us for this online Facebook discussion. I greet in particular all members, commanders, commissars of the Glorious People's Army, Umkondo Wesizwe, the spear of, of the nation, who are joining us today in this discussion throughout the length and breadth of our country. We also convey our revolutionary greetings to our brothers and sisters in veterans associations, in liberation movements throughout the entire continent. Dear comrades and friends, during this discussion, we are also joining thousands of fellow South Africans belonging to various political formations and structures of the African National Congress and our Revolutionary Alliance to contemplate our topic of discussion, which is the role of ex-combatants in the revolutionary struggle for economic transformation. For us to understand the role of ex-combatants in the struggle for economic freedom, we need to go back in our history and find out how and for what reason the Liberation Army Mkondo Isuzu was formed. What were the critical highlights of its involvement from that point? The decision to launch MK had a long and very significant history and background which we must recall tonight in order for us to understand why MK ex-combatants have such a significant historical role to play in achieving our full liberation. When white colonialists from Europe landed on our shores, we welcomed them, we welcomed them with open hearts and warm hands. Then they started to crop on our territory. In a short space of, of time, in a short space of time, uh, resistance started to fight to, to, to against that encroachment. Our grandfathers and mothers took up arms to fight against this colonial encroachment on our land. And they fought, fought bravely and heroically against these invaders. That is the reason why we insist that the formation of the African National Congress in 1912, the oldest political organization in the African continent, 
was a continuation of the wars of resistance fought by our forefathers and mothers, led by brave warriors and kings, King Mushweshwe, Yinsa, Sikukuni, and many others. The name of our people's army, Umkonto, is a direct expression and derives from the shield and spear used by our ancestors to fight for the defense of their motherland. After the Second World War, confronted by the intensity of institutionalized racism of the National Party government, a younger generation within the ANC felt that th the time had come for the ANC to become a more militant organization with a clear revolutionary plan of action. This led to a very significant historical development, the formation of the ANC Youth League in 1944. Under the leadership of Antoine Lembede, Walter Sisulu, APM Da, Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela, amongst others, the ANC Youth League was formed. And it emerged as a significant political uh, element of energizing the African National Congress. Despite the, the resistance by the older generations, led by Dr. Kuma, who had no appetite for this uh, militant spirit um, and the program of action that was put forward by the Youth League. He was eventually replaced by Dr. James Moroka in the next conference. Without uh, this deliberate intervention by young leaders in the ANC, the defiance campaign of 1952 as well as the drafting of the Freedom Charter on June 16, 1955 at the Congress of the People in Cape Town. This development would not have been possible. The essence of the Freedom Charter is found in two core demands, that the country's natural and mineral wealth must be owned, benefit, and shared amongst the people as a whole, and that the land must be shared amongst those who work it. It was clear that by adopting the Freedom Charter, the ANC had defined itself as a people's revolutionary movement, whose historical mission was to fight for the complete political and economic freedom of the black oppressed masses. And that those Freedom Charter provisions could not be realized without a thoroughgoing, deep, fundamental, revolutionary transformation of the South African society. It is within this broad political and ideological context that the ANC and the SACP found common ground and increasingly the stronger the alliance became stronger between the ANC and the ACCP. These historical ideological developments together with the increasingly brutal apartheid regime led to the ultimate decision that peaceful methods of struggle have not yielded any significant results, except for the increasing brutalization and repression of the ANC and the democratic movement. That an armed resistance was the only option imposed on us by the regime. On December 16, 1961, Umkondo seized with the spear of the nation was formed. A pamphlet with the manifest of MK was distributed widely by the High Command throughout the Republic of South Africa. Various explosions were detonated targeting various government installations throughout the country to announce the birth of the People's Liberation Army. The MK manifesto stated, and I quote, Umkondo Wesizo will carry on the struggle for freedom and democracy by new methods which are necessary to complement the actions of established liberation organizations. Umkondo Wesis will fully support the national liberation movement, and our members jointly and individually place themselves under the overall political guidance of that movement. It is, however, well known that the main national liberation organizations in this country have consistently followed a policy of nonviolence. They have conducted themselves peaceably at all times. 
regardless of the government attacks and persecutions upon them, and despite all government-inspired attempts to provoke them to violence, they have done so because the people prefer peaceful methods of change to achieve their aspirations without the suffering and bitterness of civil war. But the people's patience is not endless. There comes in the life, there comes a time in the life of any nation when there remain only two choices, submit or fight. That, is, that time has come to South Africa. We shall not submit. We shall hit back by all means in our power in defense of our people, our future, and our freedom. The government has interpreted the peacefulness of the movement as a weakness. The people's nonviolent policies have been taken as a green light for the government to embark on violence. Refusal to resort to force has been interpreted by the government as an invitation to use armed force against the people without any fear of reprisals. The, the actions of Mkondo Wisizo from now on will mark a break with the past. We are striking out along a new road for the liberation of the people of this country. The government policy of force, repression and violence will no longer be met with non-violent resistance only. The choice is not ours. It has been made by the nationalist government, which has re rejected every peaceable demand by the people for rights and freedom, and answered every such demand with force, and yet more force, close quote. I think it is necessary to quote extensively from this manifesto in order for us to appreciate the critical historical juncture that those comrades who formed Mkondo Sizwe had reached. It is best summarized in these two seminal sentences. And I quote, the time comes in the life of any nation when there remain only two choices, to submit or fight. That time has now come to South Africa. We shall not submit. We shall hit back by all means in our power in defense of our country and our freedom." Close quotes. It must always be appreciated that those who decided to join Umkondo did so voluntarily and, and only out of conviction. Their conviction was that it was the right time to take up arms and continue the struggle for freedom until it was achieved. By recalling the historical developments that preceded the formation of MK, who have shown that their decision was informed by a careful scientific analysis of the historical objective <coughs> conditions and balance of forces at that point in time. And ultimately, the minority regime and the black majority, they opted to take the side of the oppressed and poorest of the poor, underpinned by an ideological foundation that was pro-poor and working class biased. It is therefore no coincidence that those leaders who formed the ANC League in 1944 and convinced the ANC in 1948 to adopt the program of action were also those who led in the formation of MK and were ultimately the members of the first high command structure of Mkondo Wesizu. <clears throat> we can say without any hesitation that the ANC and SACP cadres who voluntarily joined MK and articulated their reasons for doing so with such clarity in the manifesto of Mkondo Wesizu were the most advanced and ideologically grounded members of our liberation movement. Their commitment and dedication to the liberation struggle were indeed unequaled. <clears throat> In joining MK, they made the transition from loyal civilian members of a broad-based liberation organization to becoming liberation soldiers in a people's army. They made a commitment and took an oath that they were prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice and lay down their lives to liberate their people and country from apartheid colonialism. That commitment was also expressed 
by the first commander in chief of Mkondo Wesizu, Comrade Nelson Kholishasha Mandela. When in his speech from the talk of the Rivoina trial, he stated that the ideals for which they joined the AIDS and MK are ideals to live for, but if needs be, were ideals they were prepared to die for. Madiba spoke there not only on behalf of the Rivonia trialists, but also on behalf of every member of Mkondo Wesizwe. The banning of the ANC and the SACP forced MK to establish training camps in exile under very challenging circumstances. Many of our cadres did not survive this, which included harsh material and psychological challenges and illnesses that we were not commonly exposed to before we crossed the borders of our country. We can say with pride, however, that in MK camps, we as liberation soldiers became politically and ideologically grounded. We were made to understand that the gun is a means to achieve certain political objectives, and that those political objectives are primary in everything we do as soldiers. I'm proud to say that the ranks of Mkondo Wesis were produced some of the very best political commissars in our national liberation movement. We were also taught and trained the science and tactics of guerrilla warfare by the best military officers and instructors from the Red Army of the then Soviet Union and the Army of the People's Republic of Cuba. Some comrades were also sent abroad for further specialized training in various disciplines, including military academies in countries like the then German Democratic Republic and the USSR. The military, the military code of MK on political and military struggles states, and I quote, Umkondo Wesizwe is the fighting arm of the ANC and its allies. Our armed struggle is a continuation of our political struggle by means that include armed force. The political leadership has primacy of the, over the military. Our military line derives from our political line. Every commander, commissar, instructor, and combatant must therefore be clearly acquainted with the policy with regard to all combat tasks and missions. All of us must know clearly who the enemy is and for what we are fighting. Thus, MK cadres are not only military units, they are also organizers of our people. That is the major distinction between our people's revolutionary army and the army and wholly militarized authoritarian armed force of the races, imperialist and reactionary regimes. Umkondo Sizwe. Uh, are now le leaders and activists combining political and military functions, functions in a characteristic way of all popular revolutionary armies, especially against uh, reactionary regimes. In the execution of the armed struggle, we were steadfast in building and closing ranks with the liberation armies of other liberation movements in the Southern African region. Joint operations were carried out with Zebra forces in Zimbabwe against the racist Rhodesian army. Our Lutuli detachment, the pioneers and the first military detachment of its kind in MK, fought heroically and acquitted themselves very well in the skirmishes with the racists. They brought back many stories and lessons about their combat experience against a well-organized conventional force in the form of Smith's Rhodesian racist army. We also forged very close relations with the fighting forces and shared many battle trenches with our dear comrades of Swapo, Mpela, and Frelimo. I'm glad this discussion is also broadcast to all our fellow cadres, brothers and sisters who belong to ex-combatant associations of former liberation movements in Southern Africa. Our shared experiences and commitment continue to be invaluable for the future development and complete liberation of our nations. Sadly, an illnesses that make it difficult for them to fully adjust back into society. It is my observation that although they do not always receive the due recognition that they deserve, some ex-combatants of liberation movements in the former frontline states 
have done better to secure their rights and continuing influence than what we have managed to do here in South Africa. It is completely unacceptable that there remain ex-combatants who are destitute with no jobs, no proper accommodation or health care. These are critical issues that our MK Veterans Association should take the lead to address as a matter of extreme agency. Unfortunately, divisions in our ranks have impeded our ability to do so. In this regard, the ANC at our 54th National Conference resolved that a process must be embarked upon to bring unity in the ranks of ex MK combatants. The National Executive Committee of the ANC entrusted the Peace and Stability Subcommittee under my leadership as chairperson of the subcommittee to take the lead to resolve these problems and to forge unity amongst MK cadres. I'm glad to report that much progress has been made in this regard and, all, and an all-inclusive MK unity conference is on the verge of taking place. In fact, this conference would already have taken place if it was not for the delay caused by the lockdown because of the coronavirus pandemic. It is our most ardent hope that the most important mandate that will emerge out of that unity conference will be to address the plight of our MK members. We have to make certain that they are not forgotten and marginalized by society and government. We have to make sure that they get the recognition and support in our society that they deserve and are entitled to as, and, 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 and are entitled to as provided for by the Military Veterans Act of 2011. Once we have proceeded to econ economically empower our own ex-combatants from all liberation movements and ensure a better life for them, our message about economic empowerment of our whole South African society will carry more weight and integrity. With the background of our contribution in struggle, with our AK-47s in our hands, the personal histories of sacrifice, the political and ideological tools at our disposal, we have a responsibility to fearlessly and selflessly champion the aspirations of our fellow ex-combatants. We have to continue without fear, favor, or prejudice to speak out and be part of the movement to fight and achieve the aspirations of the poorest of the poor in this republic of ours. Ex ex combatants from all political formations, particularly ex MK combatants, we have a responsibility to continue to be the milit militant voice and spear of the nation. We have a responsibility to continue to fulfill that role. No other grouping is better equipped to be the conscience of our nations. And no one can speak great, with greater moral authority. We are saying this with all humility, but with firm determination. The time has come for ex-combatants to stand up and be counted. Our African continent as a whole is endowed with the largest natural and mineral resources one can get anywhere in the world. Yet Africa and its people remain the most poor and backward continent industrially. The vast bulk of our minerals are owned not by the ind indigenous people of Africa, but by a few white Western European conglomerates. They take these minerals out of the ground, send them to their countries for processing, and export them back to Africa as finished products. Africans have been reduced by these neo-colonialists masquerading as business people to being consumers of finished products from the West with no capacity to promote and produce ourselves. This must come to an end and this must stop. Uh, Now, the main problem facing uh, Africa is a leadership problem. We have opportunistic and principled leaders 
who pretend to be standing and fighting for the people, yet they're there for themselves. And the people of Africa must deal with these leaders in the same way they dealt with their former colonial masters. Our ANC is in the crossroads of history at this point in time. A, mo a watershed moment has, has emerged, which is even more serious than what we faced in the 40s and the 50s. Had it not for the young lions who emerged at that point in time, the whole national liberation struggle would have been scuppered. White monopoly capital and its super exploitation of the black working class remains the ugly face of the apartheid racist legacy. This white male capitalist class controls and monopolizes every aspect of South African lives. And in everything they do, they're guided by their insatiable greed and profits. The black middle class and, and, and their professional leadership have their backs against the wall because the monopolies want everything for themselves. The black working class is bleeding profusely. There are rivers of blood on the floor. In the context of the current cor coronavirus pandemic, our own Reserve Bank has projected that seven to eight million South Africans will be out of jobs beyond COVID-19. The ANC is in the grips of a deep ideological struggle, both within itself and with other hostile contending ideological forces outside its ranks. The urgency and seriousness of this ideological struggle, with all its fault lines and contradictions, have been expedited and deepened by the coronavirus pandemic and the serious social and economic consequences of this lockdown. We as MK combatants have to speak out about the deprivation and desperation of the majority of our people that we continue to see and experience daily. The stuckness of it and the crisis proportions that it has now reached demand our intervention and action. It can certainly, it can certainly no longer be business as usual. Evidently, during and after the coronavirus has subsided, we can no longer allow the lack of commitment, lack of ideological clarity and confusion to stop us from addressing the glaring inequalities and injustices to continue any longer. As was required in the 1940s, the young lions, the young lions must roar again. History has bestowed on the new generations, the youth and the working class, together with ex-combatants, the responsibility to fight and lead the continuation of the struggle that was started by our great grandfathers and mothers for freedom and the radical transformation of our economy so that the vast majority of the black majority will benefit, benefit from its own sweat and blood. The ANC and its revolutionary allies make a clarion call to all its members and leaders, not only here in South Africa, but in the entire continent, to the youth and ex-combatants, to the workers and rural communities, to the fighting women of our country, to arm themselves with the requisite and technical and academic skills and to take over the manufacturing and production of goods in their countries for both local consumption and export, and to ensure an African market for our own goods and services. As Africans, we must form our own continental cartels and agree on markets and prices for our goods. We must arise and claim and reclaim the land of our great grandfathers and mothers. The only way for us Africans to regain our dignity is to fight and defeat inequality and poverty and to expropriate land without compensation in all of Africa. Africans must unite around these ideals and together fight to achieve them in their lifetime. Ex-combatants in particular can no longer be mere recipients of, of grants from government departments. We must all go back to our trenches in defense of our land and our freedom. Ex-combatants must be active in their political organizations and ensure that members and leaders of those organizations are committed to achieving their historical goals of bringing back the land 
and the natural and mineral resources of their countries back to their rightful owners. This cannot be achieved if ex-combatants abandon the struggle to opportunists and sellouts. Every revolution breeds counter-revolution. Ex-combatants have the skills and training to expose and crush that counter-revolution. Ex-combatants must claim their rightful place in the deployment of cadres in various capacities, especially in government and legislatures. Let us be clear, ex-combatants will not be deployed automatically. They must fight for this deployment. Through this deployment, these ex-combatants can play their rightful role in ensuring that the liberation movements are not hijacked and captured by forces with nefarious agendas and interests. As former members of the Glorious People's Army Umkondo Wesizwe, we continue to pledge unwavering loyalty to our mother body, the African National Congress. We have a duty and responsibility to resist any attempt to circumvent, undermine, and dilute the resolutions of our national conferences. Our national conference remain the highest decision-making body. No one and no grouping is above the collective leadership and resolutions as agreed by our national conference. The longest serving president of the ANC, Comrade Oliver Tambo, taught us that, and I quote, racial discrimination, South Africa, South Africa's economic power, its oppression and, and, and exploitation of all black people are part and parcel of the same thing." Close quotes. It is therefore essential that as, as, as ex-MK combatants, we must understand that radical economic transformation is not the agenda of a faction or a grouping, but it is actually the official policy of the ANC and its program. And any under, attempt to undermine this program should be resistance by every means possible. As ex-combatants, we must insist that those comrades who, make, who made the supreme sacrifice and laid down their lives for us to live freely today, those comrades must be honored properly. Those whose graves uh, continue to lie all over the world must be brought back home and given proper reparations by their own loved ones. We have, already, we have already resolved among ourselves that the impending unity conference must ensure that the rich history, culture, and heritage of Mkondo Wesizwe must be preserved for generations to come to benefit and for generations to know that a very heavy price was paid for us to achieve our freedom and that everything must be done to defend the gains of our revolution. The history of our sovereignty and independence in Africa is written in rivers of blood. Yes, we have all achieved our independence from European colonialists, except for the people of Sahrawi who continue to live under the jackboot of Morocco's occupation. But our independence and sovereignty continue to be undermined by neo-colonial conglomer conglomerates, greed and exploitation together with their imperialist governments. The time has come for Africa to free itself from these shackles. The continent cry and demand by all Africans must be for economic freedom and land in our lifetime. This is an ideal we shall strive for, but if needs be, it's an ideal for which we are prepared to die. Comrades and friends, the whole world is today gripped by a dangerous and murderous COVID-19 pandemic that is ravaging and decimating countless innocent lives. All of us, together with our governments, are called upon to protect ourselves from infection and further loss of lives. However, we must, in a proper manner, without endangering the lives of others, keep our economies going and put food on the table of our families. This virus must not intimidate us. This virus cannot and must not paralyze us. 
we must exercise vigilance and ensure that those that govern our countries are held accountable for their actions during the lockdowns and the pandemic. <coughs> our governments must prioritize the most vulnerable and the poorest of the poor in terms of government services during this period and beyond. Some charlatans will take chances and exploit this situation in various ways, including wanting to take our freedoms and rights away. That we should never allow. If anything, now is the time not only to exercise vigilance, but also, and more importantly, to intensify the struggle for social and economic empowerment of the African masses and their complete economic emancipation. I thank you all for listening to this debate, hoping that it will elicit broader debate and discussion about the role and place of ex-combatants in the ongoing struggle for economic freedom and land. That this will also encourage closer collaboration between ex-combatants in the Southern African region. And finally, in our, our entire continent. We are also looking forward to hearing your voices, comrades, on this subject and other subjects going forward, dear African comrades, brothers and sisters. Africa. God bless Africa. I thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions that have come in during the course of your lecture, and I will give you three questions and then ask you to respond to them, and we will see if there are more questions and then proceed with them. Okay. One of the comrades that was listening to you responded by saying, are we a dying organization or are we a progressive organization that still has a message? I think it will be interesting to hear how you respond to that comment. The second question that we received was, what would you identify as the most important issues that Umkontu with his way cadres should push to achieve radical economic transformation in South Africa? And then Safisu Dludlu sent a question, in fact he made a comment and then asked a question, he said, comrades, when Mkontu Isizwe went outside South Africa, we did not hijack buildings, we did not sell drugs, we did not own tuck shops in neighboring countries. How must we respond to foreigners who do those things in our country? I think it is important that we respond to these questions, Comrade Tony, and then we'll see if there are any further questions that come forward. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Comrade uh, Carl. Um, responding to the first question about whether we are a dining organization, Mkondwe um, Sizwe as an organization was closed down in 1991 by the African National Congress because of uh, specific political reasons. But thereafter, became a need for ex-combatants and members of Mkunduwe Sizwe to form an association of ex-combatants to be the voice and the champion of the aspirations of those ex-combatants. Because in life, Generally, what happens is that soldiers go to war, but when they come back to, from, from war, back to their countries, then their, their countries forget about them. This is what has happened in many other situations in the world. This is what has happened in our own country, South Africa. Mkondoesis were members were marginalized and forgotten. And they had to start their own organization 
to put across and to put forward their problems, their dreams, and their aspirations. Yes, our organization is being depleted slowly because we are veterans. And through natural attrition, comrades are leaving this world. And sooner or later, this Veterans Association will cease to exist. But for now, we do have quite a sizable number of comrades who need to be looked after. Hence, we have this organization as a fighting force, the voice and champion of the aspirations of ex-combatants who feel marginalized, who suffer by not having accommodation, health care, and many, many other things. That would be my response uh, to that uh, first question. Uh, the second question is, I'm not sure if I got it correctly, what should we do to push for radical economic transformation? I've tried to spell it out in my presentation that uh, it is important that members of uh, associations of ex-combatants should not sit back and allow other people to conduct politics in their countries and lead their political organizations and become observers and sit in dark corners and complain the whole day and be disgruntled. Ex-combatants must take it upon themselves to join those organizations, participate in the life of those organizations, give direction, conduct political education, give guidance, and ensure that those organizations represent in a true way the real aspirations of the people of that country. Because in many instances, these political organizations get hijacked by other political and financial interests away from addressing the aspirations of the people. And the ex-combatants have the necessary training to deal with those situations. When we went abroad and in exile, we were trained not only how to use a gun, we were also taught the history, the politics, the principles, the culture, the traditions of the African National Congress. We were taught how to identify the enemy. We were taught how to deal with the enemy. So, ex-combatants are well placed to help the struggle for economic freedom at this point in time because they have the requisite skills and training to, have, to help push the struggle forward. But they can't do it outside the structures of the, of, of the political organizations. They have to be part and parcel of the African National Congress and its allies and participate in its programs. <clears throat> the last question is about what do you do with foreigners who are engaging in illegal activities in the country? Um, I think we should agree that uh, as we have agreed that all citizens of the Republic of South Africa are subjected to the laws of the Republic and its constitution. And if that is so, all those who come into South Africa, legally or illegally, must also be subjected to the same laws and constitution. And uh, where possible, with illegal uh, 
uh, uh, people who come into the republic and conduct in the, in the, I, I, themselves in a manner that breaks the law. In my view, we should not only arrest them and apply the law and take them to prison, but also, and more importantly, <clears throat> after they leave prison, they must be deported back to their countries. We've got enough problems in South Africa. We cannot add more problems by having our, 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 our country full of criminals and our jails overflowing with criminals, both from South Africa and from abroad, from other countries. So that would be my response to say, we cannot tolerate any criminality by whomever, whether we are coming from outside or we are, or we are inside. The law must take its course accordingly, without fear, favor, or prejudice. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Tony. A couple of more questions came in while you were speaking. So we will ask three more questions of you, and after that I will then conclude this lecture. The first question is from Muatlodi Pizze, and he said, if the vision is to restore Africa from global political economic system, a need exists to work towards uniting Africa. Is this something that we can, in fact, achieve? Then Elias Ntansini asks, are we still on the right track on how we elect our leaders? Or is there a need to change the system to make sure that the right people occupy office to help implement our African National Congress policies? And Bongani Kumbuza says, radical economic transformation is sacrosanct if people are to be freed from the shackles of poverty, hunger, and dispossession. How do we ensure that the corporate world does not influence our leadership to the detriment of the masses? Those are some of the questions that we've received. And yes, then a last one by Sine Temba. We see a lot of new liberal economic policies being implemented by the current government. For example, push for structural reforms, such as the selling of SOEs and critical state assets. What is the position of Umkontu Isizwe ex-militants with regards to the sale of state assets, such as the South African Airways, the unbundling of ESCOM, and the borrowing of money from rogue institutions such as the IMF. Those are the last batch of questions that we will ask Comrade Tony to answer. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the first question has to do with uh, whether it's possible to unite Africa in order to achieve radical economic transformation and to ensure that uh, the land, the natural resources and mineral resources of Africa are owned by the indigenous people of this continent. Uh, I, I think that it's not only possible. Uh, it's something that uh, must be done as a matter of extreme agency. We know that our former colonizers would not like that to happen. And as a result, a number of African leaders who championed this aspiration of a united Africa were either assassinated or military coups were implemented in their countries and they were taken out of power. Because a united Africa is the only way we can defeat not only neo-colonial machinations in our continent, but also defeat poverty, disease, 
unemployment. Because we'll be pulling our resources together, planning together, working together, sharing the results of that, of that work amongst ourselves. Sharing markets, sharing our mineral resources, producing products that we can export, both to one another and to other countries in the world. So that notion and principle of a united Africa is long overdue. And uh, the president of the ANC, Comrade Cyril Ramaphosa, is, is today the, the chairman of the AU. And um, he has a very, very clear mandate for the, from the ANC to ensure that Africa and Africans pull together at all times, especially under these trying conditions. And the latest report we have received is that actually the president has been able to pull together a number of countries to sit down and plan how to deal with the current pandemic. So I'm, I'm saying this is possible and it must be done and can be done. We just need people and leaders who are committed to this principle. Uh, that's the first uh, response to the first question. How do we elect leaders that are going to be able to lead us in the direction of economic freedom? I think that a lot has to do with um, the lack of ideological consciousness in various political organizations in the continent and the lack of political and ideological work within those parties. Today, uh, generally, Africans who are members of those parties are not very clear what they stand for, where they come from, who is the enemy, and what needs to be done. So the starting point, as far as I'm concerned, in electing leaders is to understand your historical mission as an organization. What is it you stand for? What is it you want to achieve? And leaders who get elected to lead you must be held accountable in the achievement of that historical objective. If a leader departs from that aspiration, from that historical mission, then that leader is not a leader. Your leader must lead you towards the achievement of your goals. So when you elect leaders in conferences, you should not elect leaders on the basis of he's my friend, he's my uncle, he's my uh, uh, part of my faction. You must elect principled revolutionaries who are going to fight at all times for the aspirations of the majority of the people of that country. Um, otherwise, you all the time elect opportunists who are going to do things for themselves and their families and their friends and leave everybody outside. So you must be very, very clear about why you are, elect you are electing a certain leader. I said a leader that must be elected to lead you must have certain qualities and he must commit to your historical, to achieving your historical objectives. Uh, <clears throat> the next point is how do we ensure that leaders are not hijacked by corporate influence and interests? <clears throat> I 
I think it is important that leaders must be elected on the basis of the work they are doing in achieving the goals of our organizations. Leaders should not be elected because they have money or they use money to be elected. Leaders should be elected because of their commitment to the ideals of that particular organization or that particular country. Leaders should be controlled by their own organizations. Leaders must account to their own membership. Leaders at all times must articulate the, the, the principles and the policies of their organizations. Leaders cannot be in the pockets of conglomerates. Because conglomerates have their own selfish interests. And they will use that leader and they will use that organization to achieve their own narrow personal interests. So the, the, the organizations that we have and parties that we have in Africa must be vigilant. They must put comrades in leadership who are committed to the aspirations of the masses of the people. The last point is what is our attitude to selling of SOEs and other state assets? SAA, unbundling of ESCOM, borrowing from the IMF and World Bank. My response to that question is that we in the African National Congress and its leadership have discussed these issues over a period of time and we have pronounced ourselves on these issues publicly after our discussions. Because the government of the day in the Republic of South Africa is an ANC government. And that government is there to implement ANC policies. Because when the people vote in an election, they vote for parties, they vote for the ANC. And so, the comrades that we deploy in government and in parliament must go there to unashamedly implement ANC policies. No apologies. So on these matters, we have discussed them, and the, the discussions are continuing. The ANC, in principle, uh, does not believe in wholesale privat privatization of state assets. That is not the policy of the ANC. The policy of the ANC is not wholesale privatization of state assets. The ANC believes that state assets have a role to play in our economy, in uh, growing our economy, in creating jobs, um, and in, in contributing to the welfare, social, economic welfare of the people of South Africa. And therefore, we cannot take a stance that says we shall one day wake up and sell off all state assets. That's not the policy of the ANC. In the instance of certain SOEs, certain decisions, difficult decisions had to be taken for restructuring of those uh, assets. Uh, to take into account the current economic, difficult economic situation. 
Even then, we as the leadership of the ANC have insisted that uh, whatever is done to restructure any SOE or parastatal should ensure that we do not lose that asset completely. That if there must be a sale of state assets, it cannot be that on the white companies from Europe should be involved. Black South Africans should be involved in that process. And we should be careful that there is no bloodbath when it comes to the loss of jobs of the workers of South Africa. The African National Congress cannot support a situation where there is a wholesale retrenchments of thousands and thousands and thousands of workers because some parastatals are being privatized. So we have acted in a very uh, responsible manner in this regard, as far as I'm concerned, and we're continuing to engage amongst ourselves to find lasting solutions to our problems. Um, but again, it's not just the leadership that must decide on these big issues. The membership of the ANC must come to the fore and give their own voice and guide the leadership in terms of what needs to be done, what needs not to be done. And there are mechanisms, organizational mechanisms in the ANC for the membership to do just that, to ensure that the leadership is principled, is steadfast, and is doing what is what is correct. Uh, I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Tony. On behalf of the Radical Economic Transformation Facebook page, and also, of course, on behalf of the whole African National Congress, we want to thank you for this very insightful lecture. I want to conclude by making the following statement. The economic policy program of the African National Congress is radical economic transformation. It is set out very clearly in the resolutions that the ANC took at our 54th National Conference at Nazarek in 2017. What the Radical Economic Transformation Facebook page is doing is simply to promote that official policy program, that official economic policy program of the African National Congress. We are in a fundamental way opposed to any factionalism. We are not a separate grouping. We stand as the core of the African National Congress, believing that the heart of the ANC must always be an ideological position that is pro-poor and for the implementation of national democratic revolution and the second phase of that resolution that must be radical economic transformation. Comrade Tony, thank you for what you shared with us. And we thank all the viewers who watch this live lecture, and we want to invite you to continue to join us on the Radical Economic Transformation Facebook page and to continue to share in the conversations that we have with each other to make sure that the revolutionary heart of the African National Congress always stays intact. Thank you very much and good night.